Good day, everyone. We'll get started. My name is Marie Muldowney. I'm the Managing Director at CSI, a Moody's Analytics company. I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar, Investor's Guide to Digital Assets. There's a lot of buzz around cryptocurrency, blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum. Our aim is to lift the veil on the areas of investing in digital assets today. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. So today's webinar is being recorded. The ratings, financial reporting analysis, projections, and other observations constituting part of the information contained herein are and must be construed solely as statements of opinion and not statements of fact or recommendations to purchase, sell, or hold securities or digital assets. We ask that no one record this webinar without Moody's explicit written permission. Lastly, no one has permission to quote any of the comments made by the panelists or questions asked by the webinar audience. So all members of the audience are currently on mute. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box that's found in the bottom right-hand part of your screen. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, Marshall Bayer. You can go to the next slide. Who will in turn uh, introduce our panel and host the session. So Marshall is the CSI Director of Product Strategy. He is the brains behind the courses that CSI offers and responsible for thinking through our credentialing strategy. So I'll turn the session over to Marshall. Uh, thanks, Marie, and welcome everyone. Um, although digital assets have now been around for 12 or 13 years or so, I, I would say maybe it wasn't until the end of 2019 or early 2020 that they started to slowly gain some mainstream um, uh, financial community acceptance. Um, still, though, uh, there's a lot of uh, disdain, I think, from the main, from the mainstream financial community that has been apparent. But things seem to be uh, changing now. Uh, the rate of mainstream adoption of crypto, while still in its early stages, is accelerating. Uh, from the use of a, from payment platforms like Visa, Mastercard, PayPal, Square, that are uh, utilizing. Uh, crypto assets, to some corporations allocating crypto to their corporate treasuries, to institutional investors that are showing, um, slowly showing um, increased willingness to invest. And of course, there's the retail investors who, you know, have been involved in, in, the, in this space for quite a number of years, and they now have access to a growing array of investment products and direct investment options. Uh, you know, this might sound trivial, but probably if I was to use one indication of, of Bitcoin's uh, growing acceptance into the mainstream uh, financial space, it might be that uh, it might be when CN CNBC, uh, the renowned business network, started to show Bitcoin quotes at the bottom of their uh, screen, um, and they show them at about the same frequency they show the Dow Jones Industrial uh, Average. And today, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that Bitcoin has hit a new, new all-time high. Um, when it comes to considering the whole crypto world, I think you know most people are, are focused on the investment possibilities, uh, particularly a Bitcoin, uh, which is still the most known and traded digital assets. And you know they're focused on you know the reasons for buying, uh, what to invest in, what type of crypto to invest in, how to invest uh, either directly or through an uh, investment vehicle, and what are the pros and cons of the different types of investments. However, maybe the bigger story in the long term is the whole digital asset world. In, in the whole digital asset world is the disruption of the traditional financial industry that is occurring with what is referred to as distributed finance or DeFi, which is a form of finance that does not rely on financial intermediaries and is built on blockchain, a blockchain or other distributed ledger technologies. Anyway, today we're going to discuss what the blockchain and digital assets are, why they are so transformational and what are the different ways um, uh, to invest. We have an excellent, excellent panel um, to uh, discuss these points. Uh, our first speaker is Wei Shi. He is a director and co-head of marketing strategy investments, uh, the Capital Markets Group at Op uh, Trust. Uh, Op Trust is one of Canada's largest uh, pension funds that administers the Ontario Public Sector Employee Pension Fund, fund uh, uh, which is a defined benefit plan with over 98,000 members and retirees. Um, Wei is leading the development of a crypto uh, digital asset investment strategy. Um, we also have uh, with us um, Victor Lee, 
uh, who will be our second speaker. Speaker Victor has been in the cryptocurrency space since 2014. He is a co-founder of D5 Toronto, a community group that advocates decentralized finance as a use case of public blockchains. In 2020, he and his team won the first prize from AV during F Global's DeFi Hackathon. Uh, Victor teaches a blockchain course at York University and serves on George Brown, George Brown College's Blockchain Development Program Advisory Committee. Victor has over 20 years of experience in investment research uh, and portfolio management. Uh, he used to cover macroeconomics, real estate, fixed income and equity research for pension funds. He has a master's degree in applied economics from the University of Victoria and is a CFA charter holder. Um, our final speaker will be Sean Cumby. Sean is asset manager and venture, um, uh, works for asset manager and venture ca capital company focused on digital assets. Ar Arx Novum is the name of the company, Arx Novum Investments, which he is the CEO and founder. Um, he's focused on Canadian and US early stage ventures in the digital asset ecosystem space from custody to trading platform to services. Prior to this, he was the chief investment officer for 3IQ Corp, where he managed 3IQ, a global crypto asset fund that holds Bitcoin, Ether, and Litecoin. So, um, I'll uh, we'll start with uh, with Wei, and if you have any questions, uh, please utilize the uh, Q and A icon at the bottom of the screen. And um, once the first uh, speaker and the speakers finish, uh, I'll. Um, I'll verbally ask the question to the speaker and uh, and we'll get a response. So without any further ado, Wei, uh, please begin. Thanks, Marshall. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to start off the conversation here uh, with the description of what are blockchains and digital assets. And I think one of the most important things to act is, is to actually make a distinction between the two terms. Um, so I'm going to cover blockchains first, and then I'm gonna talk about digital assets. Uh, if you can go on to the next slide, please. Perfect. So um, pr probably the starting point to think about um, blockchains and this digital ecosystem is to uh, understand it through analogies that are perhaps easier to um, conceptualize. Uh, one of the ways that I try to describe what a blockchain is, is to relate it to infrastructure. Um, the starting point is to imagine physical infrastructure, uh, things like roads, railways, sea routes, airways. Um, this, these are uh, critical channels that allows um, global commerce uh, economies to function because what, what they allow us to do is really to transport um, both information and value in a physical format. Um, so digital, uh, physical infrastructure, very easy to understand. We see it, we, we use it every single day. And it's a critical enabler of modern society. Uh, similar to physical infrastructure, there are um, the infrastructure that are more digital. Uh, the one that we perhaps understand uh, better today because we have been able to interact with it for the last two decades or three decades is the internet. And really what the internet allows us to do is that it's a critical piece of digital infrastructure uh, that allows us to transmit information, just like we're able to transport information in the real world. Um, blockchain, similarly, is a, another layer of digital infrastructure. Uh, this time, in, instead of uh, providing the capability of transmitting information, it allows us to transmit value in the digital world. Now, uh, as you can see, the complement of the internet and the blockchain together uh, really starts to create a digital uh, parallel to our physical world. Um, so uh, many times when people start to talk about crypto and blockchain, it's, it's really a layer of digital infrastructure that's very complementary to the internet and they, they, they kind of work symbiotically. Um, this information plus value transmission on digital infrastructure is, uh, is a kind of a breakthrough that can't be understated because uh, information and value when it's transmitted digitally moves with much, much higher velocity uh, with much less friction. And what you're able to get is um, economic activity uh, in the magnitude and degree that we perhaps rarely see in the physical world. So, and this will be, become important as I think uh, Victor and Sean will probably cover the implications of these technologies later on. 
But I think as a starting point, a useful way to understand what blockchains are without having to dig into the intricate details of what they, what they do and how they operate is to understand it from the perspective that these are critical pieces of infrastructure. So next slide, please. Okay, so now that we've established what a blockchain is, what exactly is crypto? And, and many times people perhaps think both terms refer to the same thing when in fact it's actually separate and distinct items. So the way to actually think about crypto is to think about it as a container. And what this container does is that it contains value as opposed to information, uh, which is exactly what we just talked about before. So maybe let's start with the internet. And what on the top half of this slide, the top panel, um, I start with information. And this, let's say, is the internet, okay? On the internet, there's actually um, two layers. The base layer is the transmission layer, which is call it the infrastructure of the internet itself. The cables um, that uh, basically connects the entire world and allows us to transmit this digital information. But what's moving on top of the internet is actually content, right? And content comes in many different formats. You know, it can be pictures, it can be songs, it can be, you know, blog posts, et cetera. But all of these things are different versions of information. Um, and it's contained in these little containers called information packets, right? And these containers move information on the infrastructure layer that's called the internet, okay? So this is, you know, in, a, in the abstract, kind of how the internet works. Now, is there a parallel in the crypto world? Absolutely. So we talked about blockchain as the value layer. And similarly, blockchains also enable this transmission for value. Um, so as denoted by the bottom kind of icon there, the blockchain is the transmission layer, is the infrastructure that allows these containers to move on top of. But what are these containers? These containers are in fact crypto. And what crypto contains is actually any type of information format can be contained in crypto. And what you now have is a marriage between the content and the value moving in little packets of containers on the internet and the blockchain. So if you click one more time on the slide, um, what, you, what you see is that actually crypto is just a general purpose container. It's a software container. You can drag and drop effectively any type of content, be it images, be it audio, be it um, text format into these containers. And all of a sudden, you now have a, the ability to ascribe value to all of these pieces of the content. And in fact, if, if you are following crypto uh, or just general headlines, you would, you, would, you would have undoubtedly heard about NFTs and how these like pieces of art can be worth millions of dollars and really, this is a way to understand what NFTs are. It's just a digital piece of content in NFTs, mostly images, that's being dragged and dropped into a value container called crypto. And all of a sudden you have uh, an asset um, or a, a piece of content or property that now has a commensurate value represented in this value container that is crypto. This value container can now uh, move frictionlessly on this infrastructure layer called the blockchain. Um, maybe there's an additional question here in terms of, okay, if crypto is actually a container and is containing something of a content, um, then what, what exactly is Bitcoin and what exactly is Ethereum? Well, um, if you click once more, the way about, the way to think about something like Bitcoin, sorry, if you go back, yeah. The way to think about Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is, the, uh, is in, in and of itself a, a um, predefined content within the, the crypto uh, container. The content of Bitcoin is actually just a ledger. It's a record. And I think Victor is going to talk about this a bit more in terms of the, uh, the significance of um, something like crypto. But in Bitcoin, really what the content is, is a ledger or record keeping of who owns what. Okay, so in fact, you can take any uh, crypto asset out there and basically overlay it on this type of framework, and it perhaps makes it easier to understand what crypto is. And this is why it's also important that we should not focus a discussion of crypto on Bitcoin or any individual asset or token. It's 
a technological breakthrough. And that's, that's uh, almost one of the most important things to take away from this is that we need to understand it from a, a technological perspective as opposed to single assets. If you move on to the next slide, um, not only is crypto a value container, it is also a programmable value container. Now, what does that mean? Um, this value container is software. And with software comes the ability to actually, you know, define and program any type of um, logic into this software is very malleable, is very composable. Now, why is that important? Um, when you think about traditional assets, what traditional assets are, are in fact that they are um, templatized value containers. What do I mean by that? If you think about what equity is, equity is a template, right? All equities um, follow a similar type of logic. It's the residual claims on the cash flows of a business entity, right? It's a standardized template. What is a fixed income instrument? It's a standardized template. So currently in our world, all of, all of the value that's currently um, kind of captured through different types of assets actually operate through templatized versions of what value ought to be. In the crypto world, uh, this overall design space explodes with new optionality, new capabilities. Why? Because now value containers no longer have to be defined by templates. They are now programmable, which is to say you can embed any type of payoff function, any type of cash flow kind of waterfall logic um, uh, into this value container. So I can program a crypto token to resemble equity. That's very easy to do. I can also program a crypto token to resemble fixed income. However, I can also compose and mix everything together. I can have something that actually simultaneously have all of the properties of equity and fixed income. I can also strip away the different uh, aspects of an equity um, asset and just uh, reserve the one that I want to um, preserve for a particular token. For example, um, equity usually comes with ownership rights. It comes with governance rights. It comes with cash flow rights. What if I just want the governance rights and not the other two? I can do that with crypto. Why? Because it's programmable. So in the world of crypto, um, assets and value are now programmable. This is a, a profound difference than the world that we currently live in. And it leads to incredible amounts of innovation and experimentation um, that's currently unfolding, um, particularly within decentralized finance. Um, so uh, can we move on to the last slide? What I'll leave is uh, this uh, kind of conceptual slide in terms of uh, a, a preview of what, what is it that could uh, become as a function of this technology, uh, continuing to kind of evolve and innovate and create new solutions for our lives. We understand that the internet transformed media and communication, right? Prior to the internet, media was very, um, uh, you know, fragmented. There were different channels for different types of information delivery. You consumed content differently. You consumed them from uh, distinct uh, verticals or channels, whereas, uh, with the advent of the internet, um, the internet provided a common infrastructure, a common platform for all different types of communication to now um, happen on this uh, shared platform on a global scale. And what we got out of that is um, new capabilities, uh, new ways of consuming content, much more powerful ways, much more immediate, timely ways uh, that we've never had before. And uh, we've all lived that experience, so I think it's very easy for us to relate to how the internet has changed our lives. Um, the advent of blockchains and crypto similarly will change our lives from the perspective of it bringing a new global scale infrastructure uh, to the delivery of value. And what that means is that uh, quite obviously financial services are going to change. Um, the way that we use financial services, that we, the way that we interact with, the way that we are able to now access new types of financial services, all of that is happening, they're happening in real time, um, there's a lot of interesting, exciting things um, that are already becoming available to the consumers. Um, and this is um, in no small way uh, uh, going to change uh, a lot of things about the world that we're going to be living in going forward. So 
um, the the combination of the internet and the blockchain as long as well as crypto as that uh, value unit that is moving on the blockchain is going to radically transform um, the world that we lived in so uh, I'll stop here uh, hopefully this was a, a good starting point um, for the rest of the conversation and uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Victor to take us through the next portion of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, maybe maybe if it's okay, way we'll get a couple of the questions. Uh, there's lots of questions coming in, um, so maybe I'll ask a couple of them that are most relevant to your presentation now, and then and then Victor can get started. So we we have one question, a couple of questions on the value containers, and one is who puts the value on these value containers? Yeah, that's a great question. So this, this is the great thing about markets in that um, no one does, you know, no one prescribes what is the value behind an asset, right? If you think about even traditional markets, there's this uh, notion of price discovery. You allow the market to determine what the price ought to be for that particular asset. Um, in crypto, we're able to do this with almost anything, right? Whereas historically, um, those markets may, may exist for standardized financial instruments for commodities. Um, that capability of having a market uh, create price discovery for anything of value is now real uh, in the world of crypto. So I can, I can literally put a piece of content into a crypto container and sell it as an NFT on a marketplace. And I can prescribe a price for that particular asset, but over time, um, there will be marketplaces where the market will determine what its value is, right? Based on, on the forces of supply and demand. So um, the, the, the question of who decides what the value is ultimately is decided by the market. In secondary markets and how things kind of goes through this um, process of uh, price discovery. But in, in essence, um, we're able to uh, harness the process of price discovery through market mechanisms for almost anything that's of value today. Okay, thank you, Wei. And you know what, maybe we will uh, move on because I'm afraid we're gonna run out of time, but maybe uh, we'll come back to some of the questions if, if there's time at the end. But maybe, uh, Victor, why don't you go ahead with uh, your presentation? Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Wei. Um, you know, Wei talk about uh, what is you know, digital asset and the, the network, digital network, and use beautiful analogy of value container and programming container. I think that that his pre presentation really laid um, uh, very nice uh, uh, segue to my session. So in this session, I will talk about why we think digital asset and the blockchain network itself is re re really innovative and transform transformational. So can we show the next slide? Yeah. So let's start at, at, the, at, at the network level, um, which is a better transition from the previous session. So um, the, the beautiful about, about the decentralized network like Bitcoin and Ethereum is that it, it, it solves a one interesting problem that has been exist in the computer science is that how do you reach a consensus on the state of a decentralized network? Because it's decentralized, the the state on each um, computer can be out of sync. Then how do you uh, reach a consensus among these different state? So the innovation of Shatoshi Nakamoto is that he bring different piece of technology and economic incentive to create a way that you can reach the consensus of this decentralized network without relying on a central server or centralized entity that control the network. So that's, that's the, the innovation on the technology side. Uh, another aspect is that it is uh, open and, uh, and decentralized and also permission, permissionless. That means that uh, anyone, any user can use it without ask for permission. Uh, any developer can build application on top of those digital infrastructure without ask for permission. Uh, if you want to build an application on top of Bitcoin or Ethereum, you just do it. You don't have to ask anyone's permission. And uh, if you want to change the, the underlying protocol of Bitcoin and Ethereum, you can just submit a proposal to the community. And if there's enough consensus, they will adopt it. They will uh, put in the next version when they do the upgrade. 
So what 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 unique what build, what's the beauty of uh, permissionless blockchain is that it allowed innovation much at much much faster speed. You can do parallel innovation. So if you invest in the native token of those network, you effectively invest in the digital infrastructure. Just like imagine one internet was first created uh, in, in the early eighties. Um, imagine you can own a piece of a TCP IP or you can own a piece of a HTML and you will get a value for any usage on the network. That's what attracted me uh, to invest in, in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum and other assets. It's basically you invest in the infrastructure and you receive the benefit of any other application built on top of those network. So you have a tremendous call option, upside option that in case one or two or three or many application that gain wide adoption, you benefit as an investor. So that's the big picture side. Now let's um, move on to uh, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm, I'm using, given the time constraint, I'm just going to talk about Bitcoin and Ethereum, but you can generalize what I'm, what I'm talking about to other uh, blockchain or other digital assets as well. So uh, one unique thing about Bitcoin itself is that uh, it is the first time solve, uh, solve the, the, um, the problem of, of internet. So internet is a wonderful invention. It creates a digital abundance. Uh, before internet, like if I want to send a photo, I have to actually print a physical photo and I can send to friends and families. And usually I only have print two or three copy and therefore I have to decide which family relative get my photo, which don't get my photo. Where now with the digital, uh, with the internet, you have digital camera, you can send the same photo to anyone, many, many unlimited copy to anyone you want while you still retain the original copies. So this is wonderful for distribution distributing information. However, it is not ideal for distributing something has value, you know, like money, like stock certificate, uh, like, uh, you know, other digital asset. So uh, what uh, Satoshi Nakamoto invent is that it bring back the scarcity back to the digital world. So we need both. We need both digital abundance, but we also need the digital scarcity. So that's the, the contribution of Satoshi Nakamoto. So that's the first thing about Bitcoin, unique about Bitcoin. The second thing is um, money. You know, we always, always say Bitcoin is a money, it's an e-cash. Um, and it has gained a lot of attraction. You know, the, currently the, the value, the market cap of uh, a Bitcoin is 1.2, about $1.2 trillion. So if you rank all the, um, all the market cap among the, the global equity market, it will rank about number seven. The, basically, it's a seven. If, it, it, if Bitcoin is a company, it's the seven largest company in the world. But, but that's not, the market cap is not, uh, uh, not only thing uh, you should pay attention. What you need to think about is, is a decentralized money that not controlled by state. Uh, if you look around the world, we have you know, over about 180 country, almost, almost every country that their national currency is controlled by the state. And we, we do have some private money. Uh, for example, you can think about uh, Canadian Tire money is private money. We actually in, uh, in, uh, in 1998 to 2013, we actually in Toronto, we have a Toronto dollars and mostly are set by merchant at the, at the St. Lawrence market. So those private money is very limited, you know, it confined to uh, a small economic area or, or even sometimes just one store, you know, in case of uh, Canadian Tire. Um, for the legal tender for the national currency is always controlled by, by the state. Now, as more people adopting Bitcoin as a payment, as a media exchange, you could see the separation between money and the state. 
It's still too early to say whether this experiment is this uh, social experiment will succeed or not, but so far the trend is pretty positive. So that's the two things I want to talk about uh, Bitcoin. Now let's move on to Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum right now is the second largest decentralized network uh, by market cap, uh, but in many, many other measurement, uh, they actually number one. For example, if you count the number of developers who work on Ethereum, is they are way more than on Bitcoin and way more than any other uh, uh, digital network. So what you need to think, you need to think about e Ethereum is that it takes the concept of digital scarcity from Bitcoin even further. Not only the, the Ethereum network not only provide digital scarcity to its own token, which is called Ether, it also offer digital scarcity as a service to any other developers. So if you remember in, in 2017, we have ICO initial coin offer bubble. Like all the uh, entrepreneur come in, you know, want to sell you uh, application and the using, uh, uh, using Ethereum network as a, as a way to issue their own token. So, so what in that case, basically the Ethereum is offer this service to other entrepreneur, other network. Um, so that's one thing, unique thing about um, uh, Ethereum. The second one unique thing about Ethereum is that it introduced, uh, because, because the Ethereum, uh, the underlying programming language is Turing complete. Basically you can write any application on top of Ethereum where in Bitcoin, uh, there's a little bit more constraint on their on the online program. So there's, you cannot write any program. Some program you can write on top of Bitcoin's network, but you can write any program on Ethereum network. And one of the innovation is that they create this, this uh, 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 small uh, application uh, 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 program called smart contract. So effectively you and I or any people uh, can come to agreement and then they can code your agreement into the smart contract. And this smart contract will automatically execute that agreement once certain condition is met without having to rely on a trust that's, uh, 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 trust the third party like a lawyer to draft agreement to enforce by the court. Um, so that, that auto enforcement and agreement is the second unique thing about Ethereum. Um, so that's the two unique feature about, uh, uh, about Bitcoin, uh, so about Ethereum and then before I talk about the Bitcoin. So again, let's step back is that the digital asset is is an investment in the network. And if you invest in the, in the Bitcoin and Ethereum or you will, you potentially have a call option to any value create on top of those network. So that's why blockchain based asset is a very innovative and uh, hope you find this, uh, this, this session useful to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Victor. We have lots of questions, and I'll I'll just try and pick a, a few of them, and uh, maybe we'll get back to some of them later on. But um, you mentioned uh, separating money from the state. This is one one reasons why one reason why uh, blockchain based assets are transformative. But what uh, we got a few questions here on kind of the regulation side and the, how central banks are going to respond. Um, we know China and India, I, I believe, have banned uh, Bitcoin and. I think China is experimenting with their own central bank digital currency. Mm -hmm. What what threat, if I could use that term, does um, central bank digital currencies pose to the whole um, the digital asset space? Um, it, it, you know, if if the major developed countries start to develop their own central bank digital currency, what impact do you think it might have on on a, on a Bitcoin or or some of the other digital currencies? Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a good question. A lot of people I didn't quite uh, quite uh, sure about this uh, in the regulations impact and uh, central bank digital currency on the crypto space. I would say two things. One is that uh, um, uh, central bank digital currency is going to compete with uh, stable coin, especially the US dollar pack the stable coin. Right now is uh, you look at the market cap of all the stable coin. Uh, the US dollar stablecoin is probably 
the largest one. Well, I would say definitely the large one. So you will come, uh, the, the central bank, let's say we have a you know, digital US dollar, it will compete with other centralized like uh, US, US dollar tether and the US dollar circle, those coin, and also the decentralized uh, stable coin DAI. So they will compete with that, but um, it does not compete with the token we just talked about, like Bitcoin and Ethereum. The reason why is that the two fundamental attributes of Bitcoin and Ethereum, number one, it is that it is decentralized. And second is permissionless. Uh, central bank digital currencies do not have this attribute. And finally, uh, digital scarcity. We know that uh, central banks have the power to issue as many token as they like. They have the power to do that. There's no constraint on um, number of digital currency they can issue. So without those three fundamental, fundamental attributes of a digital asset, uh, I don't believe that uh, central bank digital currency is really directly competing with uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some and, and other uh, digital asset. Okay, thanks, Victor. Well, just one more question. Um, what is an example of a type of thing um, that will get written on top of Ethereum that will add value to its network? Oh, there's 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 many application. If if you if you look at the, the application built on top of Ethereum is a is the most uh, the largest numbers uh, we call them decentralized application DAP. Um, for example, um, we have uh, um, you know a decentralized exchange like a Uniswap, which you can trade. Nobody can stop you. You can list your digital asset as long as a uh, um, uh, uh, com uh, comparable, uh, sorry, um, consistent with uh, the ERC20 token standard, you can list any asset, nobody can stop you. So that's a major innovation. And other area uh, interesting is, um, you know, non-fungible token. Basically you create um, digital art that is, that is traceable, is unique, and uh, people can look up on um, the Ethereum network and see, you know, who are the original owner and who, What's the history of the ownership? So all those uh, uh, innovation is happening happening right now. Uh, just the speed of innovation, because the the network is open and permissionless. The speed of innovation is tremendous. It's literally you will feel that a one month on quick blockchain space, the innovation speed is equivalent of one year in the real economy. Okay, thanks, thanks, Victor. So I think we'll move on to uh, Sean now, and then we'll, we'll try and come back and answer some of the other questions. But Sean, take it away. Um, hello, my name is Sean Cumby. I'm the CEO of uh, Arcs Novum Investments. Uh, we're an asset manager focused on the digital asset space. Uh, previously, I brought the exchange listed uh, Bitcoin and Ether funds to the Toronto Stock Exchange by winning a hearing against the Ontario Securities Commission. So next slide. Well, let's talk about why digital assets. You know, um, the big idea is that everything we uh, are used to touching in our life has gone digital. Um, I can remember buying a record at uh, the Bay, uh, Backman Turner Overdrive, if I remember. I remember buying uh, uh, an eight track, a cassette, a CD, uh, getting the first MP3 player. Music has gone digital. Uh, money is going digital. Uh, this is unique money because it works as uh, the previous speakers has, have described, it works transnationally without banks or governments. And the value creation to this network is much like Google. I remember when Google went public at $80, um, all internet users are the total addressable market. Think about that. Anybody with a smartphone that can access the internet is a potential customer of a bit work, Bitcoin transaction, whether it be uh, a, you know, a sophisticated transaction or something much simpler that is coming through advanced wallet technology such as Strike. Um, this is how El Salvador has adopted it for its population. 
And anytime I see a, a globally addressable market that can be uh, you know, uh, addressed through software that can scale, you know, that is, that's where value can be unleashed in a way that wasn't possible previously. Things like Uber, Airbnb, Etsy, eBay, um, to a you know, lesser degree, Amazon uh, with their warehouse technology, Google search, you know, taking over the entire advertising industry. Um, this is a, a unique form of wealth creation and there is value in it. You can't just create a Bitcoin with nothing. It takes energy, it takes real estate, it takes machinery and human resources. If I put if there was such a thing as a physical Bitcoin and I put it down next to a similar sized gold coin, uh, even an economist, if you ask them, take, take whichever one you want, right? You know, this is a one ounce gold coin or this is a, a Bitcoin representing one Bitcoin now. Uh, only a fool would pick up the gold coin at this point. Bitcoin has in many ways become a unique store of value like gold. It started off with the idea of being a currency, much like a gold coin back in the day. You know, you used to pay your taxes, I guess, 2000 years ago uh, in gold coins. And nobody would spend gold coins today. They are a store of value. And Bitcoin went through that transformation, I guess, in digital time. It uh, took less than four or five years from when people were thinking, oh, we can pay for a Starbucks coffee with Bitcoin to it being thought of as a store of value. And in our view, and we'll be writing a, a more about this idea on our website, arcsnovum.com, um, we think that the end game for Bitcoin is that it becomes a collateral layer between financial intermediaries. And if, if that happens, uh, that's when the crazy numbers come up of $500,000 plus per coin. Not financial advice, just a, a theoretical projection. Today with CPI coming in at 6.1, um, a shockingly high number, uh, we saw a Bitcoin rally to its new all-time high of $68,822 US. Um, very timely for us to be having this conversation. We're uh, just below that number now at $68,676. Anytime you have money printing like we're having now, um, you want to own things which cannot be debased. So fixed assets, and in that camp, gold, real estate, fine art fall into those camps. And Paul Tudor Jones, when he famously said, you know, I'm betting on the fastest horse, which I think is Bitcoin, he recognized that it was kind of underutilized amongst his peers. And as it got traction, it would likely appreciate even faster than those other assets. And indeed it has. For all other digital assets, Ether, Solana, even Shibu Inu, think of them as small businesses, right? Small businesses where you could argue that you've given the vast majority of uh, revenue to the founders right up front. So they have to have fantastic governance models. And frankly, in 2017, most of them had some of the worst governance models I've ever seen. There were no boards of directors, Though there was no way for you to correct uh, the path that some of these people were on, uh, which led to them going to zero. Now, and the value drivers for digital assets are different than for traditional assets. And that's what gives you the potential for diversification because they're not correlated as directly to interest rates, sales, consumer demand. This is a network growth phenomenon through digital innovation. Next slide, please. Now, when we look at the performance, right, our goal as investors is to beat inflation um, with our savings, ideally to see it grow through uh, productive use in an enterprise. We think that Bitcoin has this potential and it has demonstrated it over the last 10 years. We want to grow the value of our asset portfolio faster than we lose purchasing power from inflation. And the common theme across many of the names on the left and on the left and their fantastic returns is that they're based on technology, except dominoes. And as my waistline knows, 
That's uh, driven by deliciousness. Bitcoin is delivered to the internet via, to anybody in the world. Like I can send a Bitcoin or a, a one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin to somebody in New Zealand right now, and it'll work as as efficiently as if I handed it uh, a dollar bill essentially to somebody uh, sitting beside me in the room. It has a unique governance uh, structure that in my examination is robust and democratic. It's a unique platform for exchanging and storing value based on computer code and the community. And while it is open source and be easily copied, you cannot replicate the community that has uh, come to dominate and believe in Bitcoin. Next slide, please. You know, here we can see, you know, a famous graph. We thought the run up in 2017 was nuts. Um, it, it sold off hard, right? This is a volatile asset. I'm not going to sugarcoat this, but the price of return is volatility. If you want return without volatility, you can hold cash, but you'll suffer to inflation. When you have a volatile asset that has this risk return characteristic, it's very important to hold the right amount. Next slide, please. You know, this was from yesterday. It's, it's quite out of date, um, but this shows a complex of uh, different coins that uh, can be readily viewed, and the size of the square is in proportion to the market cap. This is available for free on coin360.com. Um, it shows that there are different protocols for creating uh, these digital assets. Next slide, please. So the, the way it's involved, like, again, this is volatile. There have been drops of about 50% in a day, uh, even for the biggest digital asset, Bitcoin, and 80% over the course of a year or two. This can be difficult to understand. You know, uh, there are some great books out there right now. Um, Bitcoin billionaires, um, all, all kinds of uh, great introductions. And you'll see that when you read a book like Digital Gold, that this started off as a hard problem for cryptographic nerds. And, and it just built because the idea was so compelling. Many coins do not have any form of cash flow, making comparison to traditional assets difficult. Altcoins can go to zero. So a great tool that we've used to talk to people about evaluating Bitcoin and Ether, for example, in a portfolio mix can be found at PortfolioVisualizer.com. The link is on the page. And in some more detailed research that we've done, and again, this is not investment advice, but we found that an excellent complement to a traditional 60-40 portfolio would be 2 to 5% of a portfolio in crypto, frankly split between Bitcoin and Ether. Um, with a long-term horizon. Next slide, please. So how to get involved? Like you can do this directly. You can have a paper wallet. You can set up a ledger wallet. You can have a wallet on your computer, but it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, you can lose the keys. You can lose track of things and it's gone. Like it is absolutely gone. Um, if you're willing to put in the work, uh, knock yourself out. My personal view uh, and what I've worked towards for people in Canada is to create products that can be listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Initially, we did this with closed end funds, which uh, we've now are doing with uh, exchange traded funds. They're regulated by the Ontario Securities Commission. They follow the rules of the exchange on which they're listed, such as the Toronto Stock Exchange. That makes them easy to monitor. They're tax compliant. They can go into an RSP or a TFSA. Um, they're reported to you on the same statement that you get every month from uh, your brokerage account. And it works well with the financial advisor network where you can give advice and, and ask your advisor for advice of how to take exposure in the context of your other assets. So we strongly favor um, uh, listed ETFs based on secured Bitcoin, not futures, which have negative roll yield. I think it's a bit of a disservice in some ways that uh, uh, the SEC led with a futures-based product. 
Bitcoin and Ether are the mega caps and, and we believe make a solid initial base for investing in the space over a long horizon. But be prepared for that volatility. You know, uh, don't get too far out over your skis. You know, um, if this gets, if you had 4% and it gets cut in half, you, you've lost 2%. But if it does what we hope that it'll do, um, it will be a material proportion of your portfolio over time. Uh, more products are coming, some of which we're involved in based on indexes that will span across uh, multiple cryptos and uh, DeFi exposure. Next slide, please. That's it for me and back to the CSI. Okay, thanks, Sean, that's, uh, that's great. So there's lots of questions. Um, I'll try and pick the question, the uh, questions that are most frequently asked because we only have about 10 minutes left in the, in the call. You know, I think one, um, in terms of the investment case for Bitcoin or other digital assets, um, I think Sean, you mentioned, if I got it down correctly, that that uh, one of its value cases is that it's a collection layer between financial intermediaries. Victor, you talked about it being like a call option on, on the growth of the whole blockchain network and all the different applications that are being built on top of it. And then of course, there's the store of value um, uh, case and maybe, uh, Bitcoin and others are the new digital gold. So what, and this may be a question to the, to the whole group, you know, of these three, uh, um, in, you know, cases for, for, for Bitcoin, what is the most important or are they all equally important or how would you look at, at it um, from an investment perspective? Well, if I, if I could start the answer, Bitcoin right now is uh, pre preeminently a store of value. There's some fantastic work being done to make it uh, uh, programmable, fast, uh, and, and far more usable. I think there's some, so you have a store of value with a call option on functionality. Mm -hmm. um, Ether was kind of the call, the, was the, the, functionality, like the oil of the internet or copper equivalent. Um, but now with its new governance model, it, it, where they burn coins, um, limiting the supply to a degree, um, it's actually going the other way. So it was a utility and now is actually gaining characteristics as a store of value. There are many competitors to the programmability uh, and utility of Ether, uh, such as Solana, for example, uh, or Polygon Matic, um, it is going to have challengers forever. Cardano, Stellar Lumens, Bitcoin is unique. Um, and then there's the other ecosystem, which uh, is aiming to bring uh, programmability and smart contracts uh, and value creation through that method. Thanks. Uh, any other of the panelists have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, um, I, I agree uh, what Sean said. I would like to add Bitcoin um, has, a, has the longest track record, right? It, it is the, the first uh, digital asset or crypto asset. So you do have this uh, history of trust. And a new blockchain, a new crypto, it has to prove itself over time be secure, being, being used by more and more people. So, so Bitcoin has this, uh, um, a long, the longest history, the benefit of a longer history of trust. That's number one. Number two is a Bitcoin um, compared to Ethereum and other, other uh, programmable, uh, uh, smart, con uh, smart contract capable blockchain like Solana is that the, the narrative, um, the narrative of, of Bitcoin uh, as a store of value because it's, it's, it's digital scarcity is very easy to tell. You, you can sell to, you can tell to people who are not in the computer science industry, not in the finance, they appreciate. As Sean noticed that the inflation number come up from US over 6%, that narrative of store of value uh, uh, prevent uh, central bank to debase your currency that story is very compelling and easy to tell. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we have a question here on um, and 
it seems like we're still in the early stages of a, of a bit of an inflationary cycle, uh, although some think it's more transitory than others. But um, nonetheless, what what do you think would happen to Bitcoin if we if interest rates started to rise um, even aggressively to counteract uh, inflation and, and maybe at some point down the road we move into a deflationary environment? Any thoughts on what the impact that might have on on Bitcoin? Yeah, maybe maybe I'll take that one. Um, sure. I think um, I think there there's a there's a different like frame of reference that people should take when they think about inflation versus deflation. First of all, uh, what are you using to measure inflation and deflation? Right. Uh, we we've gotten used to the convention of using U.S. dollar or some type of fiat-based currency as a measuring stick. Um, I think that's useful in some ways and not so useful in other ways. I think in the most um, general terms, one should think about all assets in terms of their innate ability uh, to store purchasing power. Okay. So from that perspective, um, you, you start to have this like consistent framework where you can start to assess many different types of assets in terms of their ability to preserve purchasing power. And usually what you find is that uh, scarcity is a key determinant of purchasing power, <laughs> the preservation of purchasing power, right? Um, because a, a limited supply of something, so long as it does have utility, means that it's going to command um, a, a higher nominal price later on because it's hard to replace, it's hard to find a substitute. Um, in that case, you know, blue chip quality real estate is something of an asset that preserves purchasing power over time. And which is why you see luxury real estate always going up in price generally over time, right? It's the same idea, it's scarce. Um, so from that perspective, whether you want to talk about inflation or deflation, I'm a little bit agnostic what type of regime we enter into. I just think about relative purchasing power. Can I convert one unit of something for more units of something else? And if I can find that something where I, where I can use the least amount of units to purchase the most amount of units of any, everything else, that's what I, I want to hold. It doesn't matter if it's inflation or deflation. Um, so I think if you start to think about it that way, um, you know, it, it, it may give you a different perspective on like um, portfolio construction, asset allocation, and what you want to hold in your portfolio. Good, thanks. Wei, any other uh, comments on that? Um, I would say um, if interest rate do go up, um, it does come, it does uh, take away a little bit of a demand from from Bitcoin or any other store of value. The reason why is that uh, bond become a more competitive alternative. You know, you can store, um, you know, your, your wealth in, in bond. Right now, the bond yield is so low. It, it's a real yield is basically zero or negative. So people has to find other way to, to invest for their retirement, for their future. Um, but that said, I still wear bullish on Bitcoin, even if in inflation, even if interest rate go up, because the adoption right now, the adoption, uh, you know, think about the population of the world uh, is small percentage, very small percentage. So there's a lot, still a lot of room to grow. And uh, if you if you feel that you know that story, the the uh, you know store value is not compelling enough in the rising interest rate environment, um, Ethereum perhaps is also. A, and, 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 and a complementary uh, asset because uh, the, the Ethereum value is not just derived from digital scarcity, but it also derived on the growth of the Ethereum ecosystem, the application to think about it's like a digital economy and it will grow. And if the grow, uh, the economy grow, you will benefit. Okay, thank you. Um... There's a question here on the cycles linked to Bitcoin halvings every four years, which obviously contributes to the scarcity um, you know, or, uh, reason for investing in, in Bitcoin. Um, any comments on that and how, uh, how in the future um, can, uh, you know, the, the um, it's still, there still be this limitation on, on, on the growth of on Bitcoin mining. And I know it's supposed to, uh, um, the growth is supposed to go to zero at some point in the future, um, but how are we assured that that will happen or, or can that change at, at, at some point? So if I could take that one, the, yeah. the supply of Bitcoin is truly unique, uh, gets to the scarcity, 
because it's algorithmic. It is going to increase um, as is defined by the code. The code will not be changed. Um, every four years, the amount of Bitcoin that gets produced per day falls by half. Um, the next scheduled halving is, or next halving is likely to happen in May of 2024. After the past uh, two halvings, um, Bitcoin went up after the first halving by 90 times. Then it fell, went up by about 28 times after the next halving in 2016, and then it fell. In uh, you know, we had the halving in May of 2020, and it's risen substantially since then. Um, we think that there's still room for it to grow. The dynamic of institutions and companies such as MicroStrategy and Square, um, and now uh, payment processors, and for example, in the US banks like US Bank, uh, getting involved, we don't expect it to fall to the, in the same way it has in the past. We think that there's a, a new dynamic in, uh, in the store of value narrative for it. And we think into the next halving, it'll become more scarce than gold on, on a relative basis. And that's when its evolution into a collateral layer um, will evolve. We'll be writing more about uh, many of these topics that um, we've discussed here, inflation and, and, and scarcity halvings. Uh, and we'll be posting that research to our uh, website. Great. Thanks, Sean. Um, maybe we'll take one uh, one more question. Um, I guess this has to do with uh, DeFi, uh, distributed finance, and the various types of financial services applications that are that are increasingly being offered. Um, can can the panel uh, speak speak to that and what um, you know, for example, take um, borrowing and lending uh, um, uh, as as one of the types of applications? How advanced is that right now? Um, how easy is it to um, to access? Um, so maybe maybe Victor or, or you know can start with that uh, that uh, yeah. question. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, I would say it, uh, um, among the application built on top of uh, Ethereum, um, perhaps the the decentralized finance is the one of the very strong area. It start in late two thousand nineteen. Uh, one, uh, uh, I and the three other friends, we uh, set up the De DeFi Toronto meetup because we see the potential. Um, and since then, it has grown a lot. Um, there's more and more application you can, you can use on top of Ethereum, uh, whether it's decentralized exchange, uh, lending and borrowing, derivative, and even some of them uh, tokenized real estate that Sean mentioned. Um, so it is a very promising area of growth. Um, one way you can think about is that um, if you ever use a financial service to send money, to do other things, you, you will feel that it's so cumbersome, so costly, so slow. And why is that? Because intermediary, because regulation, they create a lot of uh, obstacle for for you to do um, finance. Um, as, as Wei mentioned earlier, you know, value, value just one type of information. If you can send uh, an email instantaneously to another part of the world, why not you could just send the money in the, at the same speed? So um, also you notice that a lot of big tech company like Apple, like Google, Amazon, they all try to get into finance. Why is that? Why? Because there's a lot of inefficiency and those big tech company want to disrupt. Except the difference is that they want to disrupt in a way that benefit them because they are centralized entity. Where Bitcoin and Ethereum want to dis disrupt the finance in a decentralized way. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Victor. Um, okay, it's 105 now, so we've run a little bit over, and there is one more question, and it's a nice segue into the last slide here, which I'll, I'll take. And the question is about CSI uh, education in the area of digital assets, and CSI has developed a couple of short courses in the, in the, in the digital asset space. 
Uh, firstly, we have a course um, currently available called Investing in Bitcoin, Risks and Opportunities. And for those who are looking for CE credits, it, it offers a five continuing education credits. And shortly, we'll be launching a second course, which is a broader course on, on all sorts of different types of digital assets called Introduction to Digital Assets. Um, increasingly, as digital assets become more and more mainstream, we are incorporating this content into our basic licensing courses, like the Canadian Securities course, for example, as per the, the direction we get from our industry and regulatory uh, committees. And in fact, uh, I know IROC, uh, as an example, has got a committee looking, looking at um, the, the, the digital space and that proficiency certainly is one of the items that they discuss and how they handle proficiency um, going forward um, with respect to uh, uh, investment advisor uh, training and certification in, in, the, in this space. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much to our, our panelists. That was an excellent uh, session. I hope you uh, got a lot of information out of it. Um, Marie, did you have anything further to say? Yeah, no, I was going to say thank you to everyone for joining. Thanks to Victor, uh, Sean, and Wei for uh, their uh, insights into um, into the whole area of uh, digital assets. If you have additional questions, please uh, email uh, designations at csi.ca. A replay of the event will be available and will be sent to everyone who registers. So thank you for attending and have a great day.